Confusion continues after a surprise election result for the Tories. But what does it all mean and what happens next? They say a week is a long time in politics and what a week it's been. Theresa May called a snap general election two months ago hoping to win more seats in Parliament but faced a shock result. The Tories second hung Parliament in seven years with no overall majority. Now her only hope of forming a stable government is with the help of Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party. So what does it all mean and what will happen next? Here to talk about this is politics expert at the UEA, Dr Chris Hanretti. Also with us from the Conservatives, Councillor Bill Borat and with Labour, Councillor Emma Corlett. So I have to ask you, I was surprised. Emma Corlett, how surprised were you? I'm not surprised at all. Uh, no, I was... Uh, Pleasantly surprised. I thought we'd do well in both of the Norwich seats, um, but we did much better than I expected in East Anglia and across the rest of the country. But I think for me, on the doorstep, things changed over the previous few weeks, particularly since the manifesto came out, because it was a very positive message that we had to take and we were able to persuade people who were wavering. So it was looking optimistic. I think we, if we'd had another week, we'd have taken Norwich North as well. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised, Bill Barron? Yes, um, because the uh, percentage of the vote in most of Norfolk had gone up. So uh, MPs like George Freeman have increased their share of the vote from 50 to 60%. And the general feeling in the country was that um, that it would be a Conservative majority. I don't think I was ever expecting a landslide that was being touted around by Labour, but I, um, I did feel that there would be, so it was a great surprise on the night. Do you think we spend too much time, um, Chris Hanratty, talking about polls and relying on them too much? Well, polls are clearly useful. I mean, I guess one of the things that we learned was that support for Labour increased after the manifestos. So we know from that that well, maybe the Conservative manifesto wasn't the most brilliant manifesto mm. they've ever put together. The campaign had an effect. We, and we know that from the polls. Uh, I mean, I think it's always right to acknowledge that the polls in the last day might be an imperfect guide to what's going to happen, what the eventual result might be. But they do tell us things about how people react what people find valuable and important and what maybe went wrong. And, and you've done a lot of work on this. I mean, how difficult is it to get an accurate prediction? It, it's very difficult. It's hard to get the national figures right. So there was only one polling company which got the national figure more or less bang on. That was Servation. So but why is that? Why is it so hard to get right? Um, it, it's hard because the kind of people who want to respond to phone or online surveys are a little bit unusual. They're kind of generous, kind-hearted <laughs> souls who don't mind giving up five minutes of their time. And not everyone's like that. And so you have to adjust for the, the different types of people that are present in your panel and make that look like the population. And that's quite difficult to do. OK, all right. Well, let's take a look at the local picture. Here in Norfolk, the Norwich North constituency was one of the most interesting. Conservative Chloe Smith just hung on to her seat, winning by 507 votes. Last time around, in 2015, she had a majority of nearly 4,500. So how did she feel about that? I take nothing for granted ever in the work I do here in Norwich North. I, as I say, I'm delighted to have been re-elected to serve and I, I never focus on the numbers within that. I'm absolutely honoured that so many people have, have put that trust in me and I would have been honoured to do it had it been a majority of one or had it been a majority of 100 or, you know, uh, and on we go. It, it, it's what I do and I'm, and I'm privileged to do it. It was always going to be a, a stretch to try and win a seat like Norwich North, um, so I think we're, we're pleased that we came as close as we did but yes obviously frustrated not to have made the last few hundred votes to, to win. I think the, the Labour Party is back in their pitching. Um, Jeremy Corbyn has had a great campaign. I think the more that people have heard his message and heard what he's had to say the more they've, they've liked it and responded to it um, and the Conservatives have been shown for the, 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 um, the spent force that they are really. They've got no ideas, no, um, no vision for this country other than sound bites. 
Dr Chris Jones there, the Labour candidate who secured just over 21,000 votes in Norwich North. Bill Borat, you were hoping, I guess, for a much more comfortable result in Norwich North. Yes, I mean, I, all credit to him, but Chloe Smith did get more votes than she's ever got. So even though her majority has gone down uh, to 500 from sort of several thousand, she still got a larger percentage of the vote than she got before. I mean, to listen to that, you'd think that the Labour gentleman had won the seat and actually still more people voted for Chloe Smith. However, I don't think we should ever take these things for granted. And I think one of the things that surprised everybody was where the, the smaller parties' vote ended up, because it's become very much, in Norwich North, for example, a two-horse race. Um, so you had votes from UKIP and from the Greens and things who had gone down. Because UKIP didn't stand, did they, in that no, constituency? No, absolutely. So, so, so they, you know, both um, the, the, you know, the Labour vote went up. Um, and by more than the Conservative vote, but but not enough to take the seat. Were you hoping? Yeah, and I think those UKIP votes um, uh, help, helped you out. Um, I think it's, it is a fantastic result from Chris from a standing start from a snap election. I think Chloe Smith ran a very complacent campaign. She spent an awful lot of time in Norwich South campaigning with Lana and the various ministers that traipsed through the constituency. And I think I found really interesting how early the postal votes went out. We were certainly finding on the doorstep people who had already voted Conservative, uh, but then were telling us that they were regretting it. So um, I, it was really, really close. And um, well, I, think we, I think we've had another week. Itself. It does, you know, it's all about on the day, but I think we were really building up um, momentum and I, things were feeling a lot more positive. I think if we'd had another week of the um, election campaign, I think we would have, we would have got Norwich North as, as well. Chris Jones said on that film he, it was a difficult seat to win. Why do you think he managed to hold on there? Oh, why do you think Chloe rather managed to hold on? Well, I think to some extent she was able to, to peel off those UKIP votes. I mean, what I found surprising across the region, not just in Norwich North, was that the Conservatives didn't benefit more from those UKIP votes. Uh, so surveys suggest that 50 to 60 percent of former UKIP voters ended up uh, go going to the Conservatives. Because in a lot of places they didn't stand, did they? Didn't in stand a lot of in places the south. They didn't stand. Uh, didn't stand in Norwich North. UKIP vote last time, 12 percent. That should have meant that Chloe Smith would have been sitting fairly comfortably mm -hmm. and it didn't end up looking comfortable. But so that surprised me. The, the, the vote for UKIP vote didn't just leave UKIP where they didn't stand. I mean, if you look in other seats across Norfolk mm -hmm. where UKIP did stand, their vote still went. So I yes. think the fact that they didn't stand in the end made very little difference. Yeah. Okay. And they lost all their county council seats they okay. did, as well. Indeed, yes. Well, let's, let's have a look at, at Norwich South. Labour did win there again. Clive Lewis more than doubled his majority to just over 31,000 votes, with the Conservatives coming second with about half of that. So how did he do it? Our secret weapon was Theresa May and her hubris. That uh, uh, aided us enormously. And, you know, I, I think if, you know, if you're going to kind of do this kind of Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest leader ever, yeah, and you don't step up to the plate. In fact, you trip over your own feet on the way to the ring and don't turn up. Um, the British public don't like that. If you're going to be, if you're going to, you know, boast about how strong and stable you are, you better be strong and stable. So an easy win for Clive. Were you ever in any doubt, Emma, call it? When the general election was first called, I was worried that that's where I've done my campaigning, particularly with lifelong Labour voters who said they weren't convinced by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, obviously, I'm someone that voted for Jeremy both times in the leadership election. But as we got closer to the election, the feedback we were getting is that for all the reservations they may have had about Jeremy Corbyn, what they disliked more was negative campaigning and the personal attacks and, and negative campaigning and some very dodgy stuff in the manifesto I think really turned people off so for some people it was absolutely a positive vote for Clive there he's got a lot of respect as a hard-working local MP but also for other people I think it was a reluctant vote but they absolutely didn't like the negative campaigning so it, over the last few days I was feeling more confident but certainly at the beginning and um, we were worried and this was a key target seat for the Conservatives well, I mean, so Clive it must be Lewis disappointing. Wasn't very confident was he because he voted against there being a general election and you wouldn't hear him now saying he regretted it at all he has um, already he said that uh, since the election you know I think he, he, he had a great result for him and I'm you know all credit to him and I think he was helped uh, immensely by the Conservatives lacklustre manifesto because I think that's when the whole campaign turned and I have to say I don't think that the Conservatives did run uh, from that the point of launching the manifesto a very um, credible campaign and the results speak for themselves. Okay well let's take a look at North Norfolk. Norman Lamb managed to hang on to his seat for the Liberal Democrats after an acrimonious campaign between the three candidates there. He won with four 48% of the vote, despite some predictions he could lose to the Conservatives, when UKIP decided not to field a candidate. Locally, I think many people, including the media, uh, took uh, 
people for granted. They assumed that 8,000 UKIP voters would switch to the Conservatives. Uh, but nationally, there was this assumption that they would win with a big majority. Uh, and that, in effect, sort of arrogance um, leads to people becoming unstuck. Uh, and that's what's happened in a big way uh, tonight. Norman Lamb there. So, I mean, Chris Hanratty, at one point, we thought that Labour might, that, that the Conservatives might win all of Norfolk, but, yeah. but Norman managed to hang on. Were you yeah. surprised? I, I was surprised. I mean, I, I think when the election was called and you had those astonishing Conservative leads, I genuinely thought, well, Norman Lamb's toast, that's it. He's, he's going to lose out. Conservatives are going to suck up all this UKIP vote. Uh, and so I have to give him a lot of credit. He's obviously a very tenacious campaigner. Uh, and was able to, to pull a lot of votes out of the bag. So I, I, I think it's, it's certainly surprising. Um, I think he probably had reason to be a little bit concerned when the uh, election was called, but uh, as we've learned, the campaign changed a lot of people's and minds. And when I spoke to those three candidates, because they all came in, they talked a lot about Brexit, because Norman was a Remainer, mm -hmm. the other, uh, and, and, and the Conservative candidate was not. And do you think that played into it, or was it more about personalities in North Norfolk? Well, I think James did incredibly well. He was only selected as the candidate 38 days before the election. So go from a standing start um, to to being within three and a half thousand votes of Norman Lamb, you know, who who not very long ago had a majority of ten thousand. Uh, I think James did very well. I think he was a great local candidate. He was born and brought up in North Walsham, um, and you know, I feel very sorry for him because I know he worked very hard on that seat. But um, you know, as it comes down to, if you look in Norwich South, that was a Liberal seat only a, a couple of years ago, and they came nowhere. And they, you know, the Conservatives Just were Just a second. few thousand, Just yes. a few thousand. You know, North Norfolk, the Labour came nowhere. I mean, he they got a tiny percentage of the vote, single figures there. Um, and obviously, you know, that, that was a great contribution to keeping uh, Norman in. Um, mm. I, I, I think we- Tactical voting, is that what you're saying? Well, I think there must be. You need to, the figures, re you know, repeated. I mean, the, the Liberals, you know, did terribly badly in Norwich South, and that's a seat that they held mm -hmm. very recently. Okay, all right, uh, stay with us after the break. We'll be talking more about the big picture and what might happen next. Welcome back. Tonight we're talking about the general election results. On the panel, Dr Chris Hanretti from the UEA. Also here from the Conservatives, Bill Borat, and from Labour, Emma Corlett. Well, many pundits were shocked by the hung Parliament result after polls suggested an easy Tory win. The Conservative leader of the County Council, Cliff Jordan, says he also thought his party would win a majority. I thought uh, that Theresa May, when she asked for a mandate to do the job, that the public would give her a mandate to do the job because Brexit is really, really important. So, but events have taken as they are, that's it. To be honest, I, the back of my mind, people didn't like the, some of the policies that were came out in the manifesto. We saw, uh, you know, the, the old people getting to, about their winter payments and getting upset and, and so forth and so on. So, if they'd explained that better, I mean, they really, really, it was poorly run, if I have to say. I, mean, I genuinely mean I, I, the Conservative campaign was poorly run. Cliff Jordan there from the, the County Council. Do you agree with him? Was the campaign uh, poorly run? Absolutely. I mean, it, there was a turning point. It went quite well for the first few weeks. Then we had the campaign launch. And, um, you know, it was full of things that nobody knew anything about. Um, I was talking to George Freeman, he's the head of the Prime Minister's Policy Board. There was stuff in there that he'd never heard about that was new to ministers. So I think that there was, uh, there was a big mistake made. And, and you know, Chris uh, talked about earlier on about the polls showing when the campaign turned. And I think you could pin it right down to the launch of the Conservative Manifesto, which was a great surprise. And not turning up to debates, was that a big mistake as well? Well, I think it, it compounded the error. I mean, not one person in a hundred reads the manifestos. We get an idea of what might be in them. But I think if you have a bad manifesto, you can still rescue that if you're able to go out and sell the policies and make a convincing case. Mm -hmm. But the Prime Minister did not do that. Um, and people vote maybe on the basis of policies, but also on the basis of the leaders of the main parties. And so maybe people were thinking, poor manifesto offer, 
and it's not backed up by someone who's willing to sell it. And making a convincing case, is that where you think Labour got it right? I mean, it, we're it talking as if they won, but it they was didn't. some of the easiest um, campaigning that I've done after the manifesto came out because there was clear water between the two parties. There was positive message to take to the doorstep. And I think, um, I agree with Cliff Jordan, which is a very rare, a very rare um, occurrence, trying to make it all about Brexit. As we got closer and closer to the election, Brexit was hardly coming up on the doorstep. People wanted to talk about the NHS. They wanted to call, talk about cuts to their school budgets. They wanted to talk about social care. And it was those things that we, people were most wanting to engage about. So I think making it one about Theresa May, all the leaflets that came Theresa May's candidate, and she turned out being toxic, but everything had already been printed and was going through people's doors and repeatedly saying Brexit. Think, and the, cool. the sound cool. bites. I agree with you, Emily. In the way that I think a lot of people felt that Brexit was done and dusted mm. because they'd had that vote about uh, Brexit and it had been dealt with so that a lot of them had moved on to the next issue so uh, I do agree with Emma on that they're thinking about families you know schools and stuff like that so I do think um, you know that was a big misjudgment in the way that the um, the, mm -hmm. the manifesto was presented. Well, I think there's a difference in style as well. In, when you know that you've got the leader of party, someone wants to be the prime minister that kind of sneaks into an industrial estate in a building, only meets party members. You've got Jeremy Corbyn going out speaking to the public. You know Jeremy Hunt visiting places. You know how many health secretaries have to kind of sneak in around a hospital? If you're the health secretary, you should be quite willing to meet, meet not hand-picked NHS staff. So I think that really set the tone for a lot of the campaigning, and we just. Um, presented ourselves as being much more open and um, engaging, mm -hmm. willing to engage with you know just ordinary everyday people. Okay, well let's hear from another MP in, in Broadland. Keith Simpson was re-elected for the Conservatives and we asked him on election night why he felt the Tories had not won the majority that Theresa May had asked for. I think it's just too early to say, people are saying, uh, media commentators, well it's the, it's the young, they've all signed up. I think there were a whole series of, of events, if you look back on um, the, the less than fortunate circumstances of our, of our manifesto, uh, that, that Corbyn seemed to relax campaigning, you know, rather like a, an old lefty from the 1970s, as I would say, and a lot of, a lot of people rather, rather liked it. Chris Hanratty, you look at the numbers a lot mm. of the time. Well, how big an impact do young voters have, do you think? Probably not as much as people think they've had. I mean, the youth turnout did go up in this election, but then turnout in general went up in this election, went up two and a half percentage points. Um, and you still have big gaps uh, in terms of age. So people under 25, maybe six in 10 of those would turn out to vote. People over 65, your pensioners, it's closer to eight in ten. But so those, those gaps remain. But more young people tend to vote for Labour. I mean, do we know why? Um, there is a big age gap. Um, I'm not always clear why that is. So people do get more conservative as they grow older. But the strength of this pattern is much stronger uh, in this election than it has been in, in previous elections. Well, let's ask Emma, shall we? Because you're talking to voters. Why do you think more young people vote Labour? Um, I think it's about um, policy. I think people were inspired. We were talking in the manifesto about things that impacted on um, young people. Some of the things that we were really strong on in our manifesto are the issues that have come up in the youth parliament over the last five to ten years as high, high priorities. Um, and I think we ran just a different style of campaign, probably had better use of an engagement with social media. But also the key thing is lots of our activists on the doorstep are young people as well. We had lots of older and retired people out as well. I don't want to get into this divide between old and young. But if you can have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation on the doorstep, I think it really makes a difference. And that, that worked. That's just my experience in Norwich South. And it's, it's not just those extremes either. It's not just young and the old. Yeah. I mean, one of the surprising things was that it was the, the voters in the 40s who, a plurality of them, went for Labour. I mean, that really surprised me. The only age group the Conservatives won was those over 65, where they won convincingly, but not by enough to, to okay. change the They result. did win the election, so... Yes, we must remember, <laughs> so they did actually win. They did so still get the, no the most number of seats, even though not a, a, an overall majority. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think it's quite interesting to look at uh, the, the demographics, because there's a YouGov poll out recently which showed that uh, the, the, the older you are... I mean, and I think that there, there's a lot of reasons around that, because people have experience of running an economic life and, you know, and it, you know, a lot of what Jeremy Corbyn was saying was, you know, you can have whatever you want, you know, and the phrase used was there's a money tree where this all grows on. And I checked, if you... It was costed. Um, it was you know, the only manifesto that was fully costed. Every penny that government spends has to be earned by someone else. 
and has to be has to come from somewhere. It doesn't come from nowhere. And I think that people who've had experience of running the economics of their own lives are more nervous about big spending commitments mm -hmm. because they think that will affect me. And I think that's why it's shown yeah. in the drift. Whereas, you know, if you're young and all you've got is uh, no assets and a large student debt and somebody comes along and says they'll sell it, uh, get rid of it, that's a very compelling okay. message. And it's I not, think that's one the Conservatives need to I think to some of the to. people that I experienced on the doorstep are best at running a, a budget. And, and I know you can't compare running an economy like running a household budget. They're not the same. But however, people that are on zero hours contract, you know, with three different jobs, and single parents, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty adept at running stuff, okay. and they know they're but, struggling, but Emma, and they voted for optimism. There is this change over age, and okay. so you know, there must, you know, we must look at why do you think that's the case? All why right, let's, is it let, let's talk about what's going to happen next because we are in this big period of uncertainty. Um, we did go out onto the streets of Norwich to ask voters about their concerns. I'm kind of disappointed that we're now in this this limbo state, and I don't think really that it can uh, uh, benefit the country in terms of our. Um, preparedness for negotiations for the Brexit. I thought it was kind of expected. I mean, saw the exit poll and at least the Conservatives didn't get the majority, which was good. Really annoyed because it's, it's now left a very messy situation with uh, Brexit and uh, going back to not one party actually going to be running the country. I'm glad that Labour did well because I voted Labour in the election, but um, yeah, just worried about the Conservatives teaming up with the DUP and what that might mean for you know women's rights or gay rights and all that sort of thing. Well, two things I want to pick up on there. First of all, Brexit. Theresa May said, give me a mandate. What's her negotiating position going to be like now? I don't have the foggiest clue. <laughs> Is it just too hard to tell? I mean, we just don't know, do we, going forward, I guess? Uh, I think that um, not only do we not know what the government's negotiating position is, I worry that the government talking to itself but is not the, entirely but the, that's clear. not true because the government has set out right from the very beginning what it is they want to get from Brexit. So they want to be able to come up with a, 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 something that leaves both Britain and Europe economically uh, better off, something that leaves Britain in control of its own borders. I mean, all of this is out there and people are saying, we don't know what the position is. It's been very clear well, for a very long time. But um, we don't have the upper hand. I think well, we're deluding ourselves. No, There's 27 other countries that are going to determine our fate. It is a negotiation. If you're going to go and buy a car off somebody and you say, I don't care, but at the end I'm having the car, the other person is going to say to you, well, actually, it's quite an expensive car, isn't it? If you go into a negotiation saying, well, we could leave without paying you anything, then, then that balances up the negotiation. So people saying that Theresa May must tell everybody everything before she goes into negotiation is great news to Europe because but then they can use that information. But that's, what, that's what the EU has done, it's published its negotiating guidelines. No, it hasn't. It's published it, what it wants, which is a hundred mi a million, pa a billion pounds. Okay, we're, sure we're getting too which, far down the Brexit is, road. And which and is what <laughs> it's probably not going to accept, but what they're saying is this is what we want, so they're being, but we might settle for less, and I think that Theresa okay. May has done the same. We're, we're, almost, we're almost out of time, I've only got a minute left, um, unbelievably. Um, some worry there about um, LGBT rights under under um, under the what yeah. may be a coalition or uh, not and women's rights the DUP position on termination of pregnancy as well as um, LGBT plus rights is um, is is really frightening the hypocrisy of the scaremongering about who Jeremy Corbyn might hop into bed with and form a coalition of chaos to, to work with the, the DUP is um, is worrying and, and I like to think that some of the more moderate Conservative MPs will have very grave concerns about that as All well. Right. We, 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 I've only got 30 seconds left. Are we going to have another election within the year because some people can't are saying it. so, no? I can't see it and there's no, there's nobody's interest. The public don't want it, the parties can't afford it and I, I just, they're going to have to sort it out but I can't see it myself. A quick word, yes or no? I'll, I'll be surprised but I'd like the opportunity to actually <laughs> become the government. Chris Hadratu? Not before 2019. Not before 2019, well, we'll have to wait and see but that is all we've got time for this evening. Thank you to my guests for taking time to talk to us. If you want to contact us, we're on Facebook at Mustard TV and we're on Twitter at Mustard This Week. Good night.